Romans 15, 14 to 33. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey on there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints." so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. It is my privilege and pleasure uh, to be with you and to open God's word with you this morning as we're nearing the end of this book of Romans, which we started, I think, back in January. So we've been in it for a while. And uh, yeah, it's been a good journey through. And as I was reflecting on this passage, I thought about how when I was a 21-year-old college student, that's when God saved me from my sin and brought me into a life-giving relationship with Him. At the time, I was unaware of the so-called Great Commission passages in the New Testament. There's probably about three or four of them that we could identify as these passages where Jesus commands His disciples to go out into the world and to bring this good news of salvation in Him, to share this good news about the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that all who put their faith in Him will receive forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of eternal life freely based upon what God has done for us in His Son, Jesus. And then, therefore, we're supposed to go out and to make new disciples uh, of Jesus. And so I was unaware of these Great Commission passages, but as a new believer, as someone who had been touched by the grace of God, I found myself uh, compelled to talk about Jesus with people. Not because anyone was pressuring me or telling me, hey, you need to go talk to people about Jesus, but because it's a very natural thing for whatever you care about, you share about. And I've said this in the past. This is kind of this maxim for me. Whatever you care about, you share about. I mean, if you eat a great meal at a restaurant, what do you do about that with that restaurant? You, you tell people about it. You're like, oh, I had this amazing meal at this restaurant. You should go there. If you see a great movie, you tell people. You share about that movie. You read a good book, you share about that with people. So whatever you care about, you share about. And so for the first time in my life, I was now caring about Jesus and found myself sharing about Jesus. That's kind of the way that it worked. I didn't know it at the time, but I was beginning to embrace the Lord's calling to join him on his mission in the world to make disciples and to share the good news, to spread the good news. Jesus has called us to be on a mission with him. And, and, and while nobody had really articulated that to me, I hadn't read that yet in the Bible, it was something that was sort of beginning to happen to me because I was caring about Jesus and it just made sense. I need to tell people about him. He's changed my life. He can change your life. He's amazing. And so I began to embrace this mission of Jesus to join the mission, to spread the good news about this salvation in Christ that I had now experienced, that I was now experiencing, and to be a missionary in a sense, whether across the street or across the globe. Because I, I heard about missionaries growing up, and I always thought of missionaries as people who go overseas. 
And I was beginning to understand every disciple of Jesus is called to be a missionary. In a sense, every disciple has a mission to make Jesus known and to make disciples in the nation. And we as a church have the same mission that Paul is talking about in Romans 15, which is this this good news to bring around to the world, to, to bring people from every ethnic group. When you see nations, it means ethnic group, people group in the world, to bring the nations into God's multi-ethnic family. We've seen that through the letter of Romans, and, and it's the same mission that Paul's talking about here is what Jesus gave to his disciples in the famous Great Commission passage um, in Matthew 20. I'm going to say the, the big idea for our message today is this, is the church is on mission with Jesus. The church is on mission with Jesus. We could say the mission is from Jesus because he gave it to us and he calls us to it. We could say it's for Jesus because it's for his namesake, but I want to say with Jesus. And you're going to see that in this great commission passage and in Romans 15 too. So uh, Matthew 20, I'll read this famous passage. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. This is what Paul's talking about in Romans 15, the nations, the people group, the ethnos, the Greek word, people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So there's a withness. This mission is something that we are doing with Jesus. He doesn't leave us on our own. In Romans 15, where we are, Paul's telling the Roman church about his mission to the Gentiles. Gentile means non-Jewish, the nations, the non-Jewish people groups in the world. And he's actually not giving instructions to them on how to do this mission. This is, Romans 15 is not a missions manual, so I can't go to Romans 15 and tell you this is what exactly we must be doing. But it is instructive for us because we discover Paul's convictions about the mission. And these are also convictions that we need to have if we are going to be with mission, on mission with Jesus in the world. We need to have these convictions in our hearts or the mission is not going to happen. Not effectively, not fruitfully, not faithfully. And so I want to walk through this passage and highlight just four convictions of the Apostle Paul about this mission with Jesus. And so the first mission conviction is this. It's that the worship of God fuels the mission of God. The worship of God fuels the mission of God. For Paul, his mission to reach the Gentiles is an act of worship. And you see that in the language that he uses in verses 15 and 16. We'll read it again. But on some points, I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You see, what's happening here is Paul is using the language of the Old Testament priesthood and worship in the temple of sacrifices and offerings. He says minister, which the Greek word is where we get the word liturgy from, liturgy. So there's a a liturgy. I'm a minister, priestly service, he says, offerings. So the priests gave offerings in the temple, acceptable. They were only allowed to give acceptable offerings. There were regulations for for worship. And when he says sanctified, means set apart or holy. So all of this is language of temple worship. So Paul's likening himself and his mission to an Old Testament priest offering sacrifices in worship of God. But whereas in the Old Testament they were offering animal sacrifices, here Paul sees himself offering to God the Gentiles as an offering acceptable to him. These Gentiles who had come to faith in Jesus uh, through Paul's ministry. So for Paul, mission is his way of worshiping God. It's what fuels it. He loves God. He's impacted by God. And that's what fuels him in his mission to reach the Gentiles, to reach the nations. And the same should be true of us then. If God is great to our hearts, if he is immense, if we think he's awesome, then we will want to make him known. It should move us outward to proclaim his name. If God is boring to you, if church and Bible is boring to you, how compelled are you going to be to sacrifice your time and your money and your energy for mission and ministry? Why would you? That's inconvenient. It presses you out of your places of comfort. Only if God is important to you, only if he's weighty and significant and glorious to your heart will you want to move outward and proclaim him. This is why our aim here is to open the scriptures and see the glory of God in the scriptures. We don't want to hammer you and guilt you into doing Christian things because there's no heart in that. But the heartbeat of mission is going to be our worship of God if we see him as great. So if Imprint Church is going to be effective in our mission with Jesus, 
then we need to believe that God is great. And therefore, we want the name of his son to be known in all the earth. The worship should compel our mission. That's his first conviction that I want to highlight. Second mission conviction is that the work is Christ's and so is the glory. The work is ultimately Christ's and so is the glory. Listen to what he says in verses 17 and 19. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. To bring Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power and signs and wonders, and by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. So this is kind of Paul's highlight reel. And he is proud. He's proud. He's proud of his work, and that's okay. Here's his highlight reel. He's proud of his work. What does he have to be proud of? Well, first, the Gentiles had come to faith and obedience. And this is massively significant that Paul says this because it's through Paul's evangelistic ministry that God was fulfilling multiple, multiple Old Testament prophecies of the nations eventually coming to believe in and obey Yahweh, the Lord. So through the centuries, the prophets are saying the nations are going to worship Yahweh, the Lord, which is astounding when you look around at the nations and and they're doing their own thing. They're sacrificing their children to idols. I mean, they're living as the world lives. They don't love God. They don't even know God. And one day, the nations are going to put their faith in Yahweh and they are going to obey him. And this is being fulfilled through Paul's ministry. Secondly, signs and wonders were accompanying Paul's ministry, which were testifying to the truth of the message that he was bringing. And thirdly, third highlight reels that Paul preached the gospel over this 1,400 miles between Jerusalem and Illyricum, all in sandals. I mean, I get blisters on day hikes. I'm three miles in. I'm like, my knee hurts. I think I'd last maybe half a day with the Apostle Paul. He's going 1,400 miles in, in sandals, facing much persecution. And notice That while Paul is proud of his work, he's not proud in a sinful, self-glorifying way. Because I think in Christian circles, we we talk about how pride is like the the, the essential sin, the central sin of all things, which I think is true. But there there is a legitimate form of pride that we can have, and Paul has it here. He believes that he was truly working. He doesn't discount his effort. But notice that he says, in the ultimate sense, it was Christ who was working through him, accomplishing the mission to reach the Gentiles with the good news. He says in verse 18, I do not venture to speak beyond what Christ has accomplished through me. What Christ has accomplished through me. So that's the mystery of the Christian life is we are working, but Christ is working. So that in the end, he receives the glory. So so let me just point out a, a few things. This means a few things that Christ accomplished these things through him. Number one, Christ again is on mission with us. Christ was with Paul. Working through Paul. Same is true for us. Great commission, I will be with you to the end of the age. We are working in ministry and in gospel outreach, but Christ is working through us. He's with us, which means we're not alone. And he's working through us, which means we're not operating on our own power. And then what what this means is that he gets the credit and he gets the glory. You see that? He gets the credit. He gets the glory. And spiritual pride is a danger for all of us. So if we are tempted towards spiritual pride, all we think we need to do is, is at least in the moment, not that it's going to be um, solved in one passage, but in a moment of temptation towards spiritual pride, and that's the hard thing because we don't even know when it's happening. That's why we got to be in the Bible. And we look at Paul, and and I'm just going to, this guy's in sandals and he's preaching 1,400 miles, and and he's facing persecution. I, I look at his highlight reel, and I'm like, who am I? Who am I? We're all tempted towards spiritual pride. We're tempted to take credit, right, for, for spiritual successes. Like pastors are tempted toward this. Churches. You can have sinful pride in your church. Churches are tempted toward this. Individuals, you're tempted toward this. Anything good that happens in and through imprint church and anything good spiritually that happens in your life and through your life is ultimately attributable to Christ who's in you and who is working through you. He gets the credit. He deserves all the glory. And how wonderful, praise God, that, that, that Jesus would invite us into this mission with him. So, so I think this passage should, should humble us when we see that Christ is working in us and he's working through us and he gets the credit, he gets the glory. That's the second conviction. Third mission conviction is that people everywhere need to hear the message. And maybe that sounds like, well, yeah, duh. But we, we should probably, 
Think about this for a little bit. People everywhere need to hear the message, and I'll qualify that, in order to be saved, and that one must put their faith in the message, in Christ, in order to be saved. So Paul's ministry philosophy was to work only in areas where Christ hadn't been preached yet. That's his standard. Is there a gospel witness there yet? Are there churches there yet? If so, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go to unreached areas. That was his ministry philosophy and practice. He says in verse 20, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. So he planted churches in key locations and strategic locations. And, and then once he established like new believers there and churches there, he expected them to go out into the surrounding areas and to preach the gospel. So it's not as if everyone who converted to Christianity out of the pagan world did so because they heard Paul individually sharing the gospel. He was the tip of the spear, as it were, who went into these areas and reached unbelievers and planted churches. And then those churches then went out and brought the gospel. And if people are going to hear the gospel on the east side, it's not because we're going to squeeze everyone into this building. Like, Woodenville and Bothell and Redmond, they're not going to squeeze into this building to hear the gospel. The way that this works in the apostolic tradition is to preach the gospel to believers, to equip the believers, who then they themselves go out and share the gospel with this conviction that people everywhere need to hear the message. I mean, why is Paul willing to travel thousands of miles on foot and face danger and threat and persecution everywhere he went? It's because he believed that people everywhere need to hear the good news of Jesus in order to be saved. Remember his logic of this back in Romans 10 about the necessity of hearing the message? Let me read this again to you from Romans 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you have to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And and then he asks the question, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Then down in verse 17, he says, so therefore faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The logic of all of this is, If a person is going to call in the name of the Lord to be saved because people need to be saved, people are under the just judgment and penalty for their sin under God's wrath, they're going to face him on the judgment day. And if people are going to be rescued from sin and death and from God's judgment, they need to call in the name of the Lord. And how can they call on him if they've not heard of him? They've got to believe in him. Somebody's got to be sent to preach the message that Christ died and rose again to reconcile them to God. And this is why Imprint Church's partnership with our friend Pastor Napoom and his church in Myanmar is so important to us because they're literally going into areas in Myanmar where the name of Jesus is is unheard of. Taking it to, to completely unreached Regions. So there's much about the Apostle Paul that we see um, in, in Pastor Nopum and his, his sense of urgency to bring the gospel to completely unreached areas. Now, we could say, if, if, we, if we had to adopt Paul's practice, we could just say, let's just close our doors and, and move to completely different areas because the United States in this east side already has churches. Paul's practice is not saying that we should not have churches in these areas because we are to plant churches and then we are to go out and spread the gospel. But even here in Seattle, if you think about it, there are people who have heard of Jesus. They've heard the name of Jesus. but They have no clue about Jesus. Not too long ago, I had an opportunity to share the gospel with one of my neighbors, and he had heard of Jesus before. But essentially, he knew nothing of Jesus. He thought the essence of the Christian message was try to be a good person. Like, that was it. And I remember when my kids were in kindergarten, one of my daughters uh, mentioned God in a conversation, and, and one of her classmates said, what's God? Like five, six-year-old girl, never heard of God. So while people here have heard of Jesus, so many people here know nothing about Jesus. They are completely ignorant of the good news of salvation in Jesus. So we have to have this conviction that people everywhere need to hear the message. They think they, a lot of people here think they've heard the message, but what they've encountered is not the true message of Christianity. They may have encountered some form of cultural Christianity, some kind of prosperity, health, and wealth gospel where you just do good and God will bless you and have a lot of faith and give money to the churches. Who knows? But, but people need to hear the message of the gospel in order to be saved. And that, my friends, is offensive to our culture The world does not like our conviction that people need to hear the message and accept it in order to be saved, in order to be right with God. 
Because many people just want to believe that they can chart their own path to God. As if you can just carve your own way and God will come down to your terms. God sets the terms for relationship with him. I, I just don't see how that's, if we made that up, maybe that's offensive. We didn't make this up. Jesus is the one who said no one comes to the Father except through him. This is the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. People want to believe they can chart their own path to God. But Jesus himself says that he's the only way. So what we have to think about with this conviction that people everywhere need to hear the message in order to be saved is that if we're going to be faithful on mission with Jesus, we can't give up this conviction that people need to hear it and that Jesus is the only way. But in tandem with that conviction needs to be this idea that that if we're going to be on mission with Jesus, then we need to live in the way of Jesus. And the Gospel of John, first chapter, tells us that he came, he was full of grace and truth. So what this means for us on mission with Jesus is that we need to hang on to this conviction, this truth that people need to hear and accept the message of Jesus. But, that's the truth, but we need to have a gracious disposition toward people. Because we will just undercut our message, undercut our credibility if you're trying to convince people about Jesus, but you're being a jerk about it. And you're being judgmental about it, which is why in 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer for anyone who asks you for the reason that you have this hope within you. But do this with gentleness and respect. The way that some Christians treat unbelievers in their conversations, like why would I ever want to come even close to this? With what your demeanor and your attitude is communicating, it's so harsh. So we have to maintain this conviction this truth that people need to hear the message, but do it in the way of Jesus, full of grace and truth, in a gracious disposition. It doesn't mean cowardly. In fact, it means brave because people are going to impose the message, but you can do it in a way that's gracious. May God give us grace to do it in a gracious way. If we give up the conviction that people need to hear the message to be saved, then you know what we're going to do? We'll become, as they call it, a holy huddle. Like we'll just kind of huddle up with other Christians and we'll enjoy the blessings that we have. And meanwhile, The world outside our doors is languishing and dying in sin and in hopelessness apart from Christ. The world needs Christ. Our neighbors need Christ. Our loved ones need Christ. Think of the people in your life, if you're a believer, who are far from God. Can't you feel that when you're you're with them? There's just a, a different demeanor. There's a different attitude toward life. Like I feel that when I'm in Uh, extended family circles, when my family is kind of like the black sheep and and, and we're the believers and we love our family deeply, but we can feel their distance from God. They need Christ. People in the world need Christ. So think about who in your own sphere God might be leading you to pray earnestly for, especially who is hurting in your sphere who doesn't know Christ because often it's pain that God uses to soften people and open people up to the gospel. Who can you share Christ with? And think about, in in light of Paul here wanting to reach unreached areas, I think it's good for us to think about how God might lead you to support mission work in places with no gospel witness. I thought it might encourage you guys to know that Imprint has recently decided to, we've committed to financially supporting a missionary with Wycliffe who works in Southeast Asia, um, training Bible translation teams, helping them to translate the Bible into languages that don't yet have a Bible in their language. This is not to, to make ourselves look good or pat ourselves on the back, but it is to say God's given us resources, and we as a church are using resources that we have for the sake of mission in the world, but God may also call you, and I know some of you individually support missionaries. Our family has supported a number of, of, of domestic missionaries who are working with YWAM and international students and things like that, and God gives us resources. Where will we invest our, invest our treasures? It's good to give our money away. It's good to give it to the things that God cares about because we have this conviction that people everywhere need to hear this message. Paul saw his strategy of going to unreached areas as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, which which he quotes in verse 21. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So he sees his ministry as a fulfillment of this prophecy that people are going to hear this message. They're going to see, and they're going to understand. And it's actually Paul's commitment to bringing this gospel to unreached areas that prevented him from seeing and visiting the Roman church for so many years. So now that he's finally completed this 1,400-mile circuit, he says, I can come visit you, Lord willing. I want to spend time with you. 
He says in verse 24, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a little while. This is a good mission, partnership, philosophy, relationship, and prayer and financial support. It's not just, hey, I need your money and I need your prayers. Can you just send it my way? It's I want to see you. And that's why there are missionaries who, who come and they spend time with you and they talk to you. Relationship is at the heart of this thing. So he wants to spend time with the believers there, but notice mission is on the forefront of his mind still. He says oh, he wants their support on his, he's very ambitious to go to Spain, to go to Spain, west of Spain. But before he goes to Rome, he's going to deliver a financial gift that he had been collecting from various churches. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians. You can read about it in 2 Corinthians. And he's talking about it here. He's collected money because there is extreme poverty that the, that the Jewish believers in Jerusalem are experiencing. And so he is collecting support and he's going to add another thousand miles or whatever tack onto his trip in his sandals to go deliver this gift. Right? And so he wants them to support his mission west of Spain. Before he does that, he's going to Jerusalem. And this is good to think about because caring for the poor, these poor believers in Jerusalem, caring for the poor has been the heartbeat and has been a practice of the Christian church from its very earliest days. Caring for the poor was not seen as subordinating the gospel to social concerns. It was seen as a fruit of the gospel's transforming power in the lives of God's people. And this is why so many of you have been supporting uh, kids, sponsoring kids through African New Life Ministries because God has given us resources. We don't see it as subordinating the gospel to social concerns to, to care about the poor. We see it as, as a fruit of the gospel's transforming power. This is what God calls us to do. And this is why we as a church have sent money, relief money, to, to Pastor Nopum and, and the believers there in Myanmar to help them with relief because of the economic ravages they're experiencing because of COVID. So the last mission conviction of Paul I want to highlight is this, is prayer is not optional. Prayer is not optional in the mission of God. Now, we would all say, and I would throw my, my, my I would say this too, we all say prayer is essential. What Christian is going to say, hey, is prayer optional? Nobody's going to say prayer is optional. But yet that's often how we treat prayer, is it not? Myself included. Prayer is optional. Like I don't really need to pray until I begin to feel sort of that, my lack, and, and maybe I get myself in a bind, or maybe I feel like I'm in over my head. Then maybe I'll pray. But if I feel like things are going smoothly and I've got it together, then, then I don't even realize how much self-reliance I have. We don't realize how much self-reliance our ha- we have. Our prayerlessness is proportionate to our, our sense of self-reliance. Or to say inversely, how much we pray, is, is, it's inversely related to, I'm confusing myself right now. It, if you're self-reliant, you're not going to pray. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> My gosh. You will only pray when you realize, I can't do this on my own. For Paul, prayer is not optional. Look at verses 30 to 32. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. So he asked essentially for two things. He asked, I want... Pray that I would be rescued from the persecution in Judea and pray that this offering that I'm taking would be acceptable to the church there in Jerusalem. There's a sense of dependency. I can't just do this on my own. I need you to strive together with me. It's, there's, there's a wrestling there in prayer. I need you to strive with me in prayer. It's a repudiation of self-reliance. I think as Americans, it's just in the water. It's, we rely so much on our intellect in our ingenuity. We're like a get it done kind of people. Take the bull by the horns, take charge. We like to take charge and get stuff done. But if we bring this self-reliant mindset into the church, and we often do, it'll strip away the power for mission. It'll strip away the power of disciple making because we'll think we can do it in our own strength. And we will treat prayer as optional. I think back to my first years in ministry when I was a a new Christian. I knew I was supposed to pray, but I, I barely prayed. I barely prayed. I was like discipling students. And yes, God was gracious to me to enable me to do good work in ministry. But I look back and I go, oh my gosh, I was just operating so much just in my own, in my own strength. I didn't cry out to the Lord, Lord, would you change this person's heart as I share the gospel with them? Would you do something in them? I just kind of went into these meetings and, and just over time, God, and it's still working on me. And I'm sure he's working on you to repudiate your own self-reliance. Because if we're self-reliant, we'll treat prayer as optional. 
Our self-reliance keeps us from taking Jesus seriously when he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Can we do church apart from him? Yeah. A man can get up and read some Bible and make some comments. Some musicians can get on stage and sing some songs. But if any true worship and life transformation is going to happen, we need the power of Christ. Can we send out generosity groups in our community to serve apart from Christ? Sure we can. Little, people, uh, little bands of people can get together and they can go out into the community and they can serve apart from Christ. But if that service is going to accurately image the generosity of God to the world around us and demonstrate through action that Jesus is alive and worthy of our trust, then we need the power of Christ. Can you share the gospel with an unbeliever, a non-Christian, apart from Christ? Sure, you can open your mouth and you can say the right words. But if spiritual blindness and spiritual death are going to be overcome, doesn't there have to be a sense inside you that says, I can't open this person's spiritual eyes. I can't change this person's heart. I can't raise the spiritually dead. I need the power of Christ. Like we can't do anything of eternal value apart from Christ. And yet my concern is because we know how to do these. I'm a pastor. I've been doing this for years. I know how to come into a church and say hi to people. I know how to to open a Bible and and, and make some observations. Our musicians are talented. They know how to sing songs. We can get groups of people together. We can organize an event. But could we do all these things without the Holy Spirit showing up? Yeah, we could. And that's a bad place to be. That's playing church. Church. That's faking Christianity. Life in Christ is life in his power. The mission of God requires the power of Christ. The greatest miracle that I think I could see in my own life and in the life of this church is if we started seeing people come to Christ. And this, friends, is not a guilt you into evangelizing moment because I don't want to do that. We talk about miracles, miracles, A miracle would be if we felt strongly enough compelled to reach the people who are far from Christ and to share the gospel in the power of Christ and to see new life happen. This is hard ground here in Seattle, and sometimes I'm like, maybe I should just go to a third world country where the poor are longing for good news. I feel like when I share the good news here, people don't care. I, I I see a glazed look come over them, and I wonder, They they don't see it. They don't care. And that makes me realize I need the Spirit of God to work in this moment. Nothing destroys my self-reliance like sharing the gospel with somebody who doesn't know Christ when I see that wall up in front of them. God, you've got to overcome blindness. I can't do that. I need God to come in. And that's what he did in my dead heart is he's shown the light in my heart. And if you're in Christ, that's what he did in your heart. He's shown the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ into your heart. And he turned the lights on and he gave you a new heart. We can't do this apart from him. When it comes to the mission, prayer is not optional. God forgive me for treating prayer as optional. Like I can just do this on my own. Jesus is alive, risen from the dead, and he's on mission. He's bringing people from death to life through the gospel. And he's teaching them a new way of life. So he's bringing people to life, and then there's a new way of life that we're learning, right? So it's, it's not just a get in the door. It's a whole new life. It's a new reality of life in Christ, as we like to say around here. In grace, he's commanded us, and he's invited us into this mission with him. It's an invitation, and it's a command. So let me close by asking these four questions based on these convictions. Do you believe that God is great and deserves to be known in the world? Do you believe that Christ is working in you and through you? Do you believe he's with you and that he's working through you? Do you believe that everyone everywhere needs to hear the message of Christ? And do you believe that prayer is essential to the mission? Would you ask the Lord to work on your heart and to deepen these convictions that we might, together as a church community, join with Christ in his mission to share this life-saving message and this life-changing message. God, give us grace. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that you have given your life for us and that you've called us into life with you and that now you 
call us into this mission with you um, to make your good news known, to make this gospel message known, and to, and to not only make it known through our words, but also through our works. Lord, I didn't really get to unpack that here, um, but that is a big piece of it, God, is, is our words and then our works that testify to the reality of Christ. So Lord, would you make Imprint Church, would you make us a people who are zealous worshipers, who feel compelled in our hearts because of how great and how awesome you are to make you known in the world, that we might take seriously this call and not be burdened by guilt, not be burdened by, well, um, this is our obligation, but God, that this life-giving worship of the living Lord would compel us to to move outward, Lord. Would you be um, greater to our hearts, Lord Jesus? Would we understand that you're in us, that you're with us, and that you're working through us, Lord? Would you give us conviction that people everywhere need to hear the message? And would you, Lord, uh, please uh, show our hearts that we are foolish to be self-reliant. God, forgive us for our self-reliance. We're so weak and needy, and yet we think we're strong. And, and usually it's, it's times of pain and suffering that, that you show us uh, graciously that, that we do need you. So, Lord, I, I pray for the miracle of new life that happens through our witness as a church, that that we would never give up um, this idea that we're on mission and that we would never um, play church, play Christian. God, forgive us for these things, for where we failed, and call us into a new way in this new life that we have in you. We love you, and we thank you that you, this is your mission, and it's not our thing that it's all on our shoulders. It's yours. You are the missionary, Jesus, and you're doing the work. And and Paul said that he would not venture to, to, to speak of what, other than what you had accomplished through him. And so, Lord, would you accomplish much in us, Lord, and through us in the mission and ministry of Imprint Church. We pray now in your name for your glory. Amen.